His fighting style mirrored his personal life, as he was a free-spirited, wild swinger. He lived life on the edge, flying planes without a license, smoking Cuban cigars with solid gold lighters, and dating women, both young and considerably older, and when his mop-top haircut had some teenage fans mistaken for one of the Beatles, he became known as Oscar Bonavena was born on September 25, 1942, in Buenos Aires, Argentina, the seventh of nine children born to Italian immigrants. My parents came from Italy, Bonavena said. My ancestors were gladiators in Rome. Oscar quit school at the age of 11, working a variety of odd jobs like pizza delivery, Coca-Cola salesman, butcher, and stonecutter. At the age of 14, he wandered into the Huracan Boxing Club and found his calling. Oscar lost his first amateur bout, but became a national champion in only three years, compiling a 46-2 record with 36 by knockout. But his amateur career was cut short when he took on American Lee Carr in the Pan American Games. Behind on points, Bonavena gave a new meaning to the phrase hungry fighter as he bit into Carr's shoulder, neck, forearm, or nipple, depending on the news report. Matchmaker Teddy Brenner later tried to rematch Carr with Bonavena as professionals, but Carr refused. The only way I'll fight him again is if he has all of his teeth pulled, Carr said. Despite Oscar's bizarre behavior, he impressed restaurateur and boxing manager Jack Singer enough to be brought to New York to fight professionally. The now married Bonavena arrived without his family, and Singer set him up in a small apartment while giving him a stipend to get by while he trained. But Bonavena complained about not getting paid enough and missed his wife, Dora. Singer acquiesced to the demand, sending for Bonavena's wife, but upon her arrival, she immediately demanded larger living quarters. Bonavena slowly learned English, and Singer discovered that Oscar's two favorite words were, quote, give me money. Singer soon grew tired of Bonavena's demands and sold his contract to optometrist Marvin Goldberg, a one-time college boxer who wanted to be in the fight game. I didn't want to sell the clown to the dock, Singer said. I did everything to talk him out of it. I even called his wife. But no, he was dying to be burned. Goldberg spoke Spanish, which helped, and he set up Bonavena to be instructed by Charlie Goldman, the legendary trainer of Rocky Marciano. Goldman was initially impressed by Bonavena. This guy is a better boxer than Rocky was at the same stage of his career, Goldman said. But Rocky was a better puncher. Bonavena became a headliner at Madison Square Garden in his sixth fight, unheard of in the day. But in his ninth fight, he bit off more than he could chew against the crafty Zora Foley. The veteran gave Bonavena a beating over ten rounds, knocking him down in the eighth. New Yorkers didn't care for Bonavena's boorish personality, and he returned to his native Argentina, where he could do no wrong. He parked his car wherever he pleased and was under no obligation to obey speed limits. He notched 14 fights into the win column, including a decision victory over the popular Gregorio Peralta for the Argentine heavyweight title. Bonavena then returned to New York and took a majority decision against the always rugged George Chivalo. He began to rise in the rankings, but trouble emerged in the gym. Goldman was having enough of Bonavena's flippant attitude, with the language barrier being just one of the many problems. Charlie would tell the interpreter what he wanted Oscar to do, Trainer Sid Martin said, and the guy would tell him something else, or Oscar would do what he pleased and blame the interpreter. Bonavena saw the elder Goldman as a feeble-minded old dreamer. The fighter didn't show up for sparring sessions, numerous workouts were called off, and on one occasion he showed up to the gym chomping on hot dogs. Goldman realized that Bonavena was a far cry from Marciano. 
The Rock was willing to sacrifice all of life's pleasures to become heavyweight champion of the world, while Ringo would sacrifice nothing. Instead, Bonavena built Dr. Goldberg for airplane tickets, car rentals, phone and restaurant bills, and unneeded boxing equipment. Goldberg eventually had to sell part of his ownership to a syndicate which consisted of a stripper, a jockey, and an assortment of other investors who all eventually came up empty in dealing with Bonavena. Despite the headaches, the strongman heavyweight did show promise when he took on the undefeated Olympic champion, Joe Frazier. Round is almost over. Frazier was the only American to win a gold medal in the 1964 Olympic boxing tournament. He's taken the mandatory eight count. Frazier was down from a short right. We've got more than half the round to go. Frazier down again. He's got to take the mandatory eight count. Five, six, seven, eight. One more knockdown and Frazier will be out of it. Bonavina has a cut over the left eye. Bonavina is cut over the left eye. One minute to go in the round. Frazier comes back with a good left hook. Neither boy has worried too much about defense in this one. Joe Frazier and White. After being knocked down twice and almost out in the second round, Joe Frazier has come back to take charge of the bout. At the end of the bout, we'll have an interview with the winner, and should there be a knockout, we'll have a replay of the knockdown. Hard left hook by Frazier, a hard one. Less than a minute to go in round five. Five seconds left as Bonavena is putting on a terrific finish against Frazier. Fifteen seconds left. Listen to the applause. Bonavena looked at the clock. And there it is, the final bell of what we consider a very fine fight. We'll have an interview with the winner. We'll return to Madison Square Garden and the decision of this fight. Scores five rounds for each boy. Points, seven to five points, favor of Bonavena. The winner, the winner by a split decision. Joe Bonavena impressed in the loss, but once again returned to Argentina, campaigning there for over a year before entering an eight-man elimination tournament for the vacant WBA heavyweight title. He drew Carl Mildenberger in the first round, traveling overseas to face the German on his home turf. Well, Angie Dundee, <laughs> the roar of the second wild bull of the Pampas, Oscar Bonavena, of course. As I was saying, Angie Dundee hardly needs me to tell him what to ask a fighter, but be, 
because our viewers will want to follow what you're talking about in Spanish, Angie, let me presumably lead you. Oscar has never fought a southpaw before. Uh, how is he going to make his fight against Mildenberger? No, he says it doesn't make any difference. Right hand and left hand is going to go and attack him. What will be his principal weapon? Que la cosa principal que tu usar, que es la... Pegarle. Hit him. That's all he's going to do. He's going to hit him. You have often said, Angie, that the left hook is the best blow against the southpaw. Uh, yo solo necesito saber vos de que la mano sinistra es la mejor cosa para los zurdos. ¿Qué tú piensas? Este, este bueno. Pero con esto lo voy a noquear. He's going to hit him with the right hand, but flatten him with the left hook. <laughs> Ask him how long it's going to take. ¿Cuánto tiempo te pesó en que para... Dos meses. No, para vincer este uh, combatimiento. Menos de 12 rounds. It's going to be less than 12 rounds. But he doesn't want to state how early. ¿Cuándo es definitivo que round? Antes de esto. Six rounds. Six rounds. The sixth round. We wish you bluebirds in the spring, luck on the pampas, <laughs> and we hope that perhaps you'll go on no into the semifinals. No, 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 okay. Thank you, Angie. Thank you, Oscar. You're welcome. He then figures... for going down early, but again, remember, like Patterson, he goes down often and gets up often. We have 20 seconds left in this first round. Mildenberger is definitely hurt, as you heard Angie say. Well, I'll tell you, 
The spin, the strength, and the punch has done the job in the awkwardness of Bonavina, and he's a converted southpaw. That's what's messed up Middlenburg. He couldn't figure out which way Bonavina's going. Quickly, before the bout terminates, and before we go back to New York and Jim, Jimmy Ellis, your man, may have to fight Bonavina. Is Bonavina too strong for him? I don't know about that. Jimmy Ellis is a good fighter, and I've said this before, egotistically, Jimmy Ellis is going to win it all. The decision has been announced. But they didn't give the voting as yet. They have not given the voting, but they have declared Oscar Bonavina the winner of this quarterfinal match in the World Boxing Association-sponsored heavyweight elimination tournament. The next quarterfinal will be October 28th. Jerry Quarry, who knocked out Billy Daniels in the first round last night against Floyd Patterson, the two fought previously. It's a happy Oscar Ringo Bonavina. In his next bout, Bonavina once again traveled to his opponent's hometown, this time to face Jimmy Ellis in Ellis's native Louisville, Kentucky. Two-minute mark in round three. This is round three, and there you go! A hard, hard overhand right to Dick Bonavina. Eye on the left side of Bonavina's head, and Bonavina is in trouble. A half a minute to go in the third round. Bonavina, Bonavina holding on. He's got to move and make his move fast. He's been told that by his corner. Ellis was hurt by that blow into the stomach. The right. Ellis is hurt. Ellis is hurt. Bonavina got him with the left, and he is in pain. But he's fighting back, as you saw, with his left and holding on. We're a minute and a half into the final round. And a good left took by Bonavina. Staggered Ellis. Now Oscar laid himself open for the chopping right that you saw. Again against the left side of his face. After the bout, Bonavena took a chair from his dressing room and sat on it while taking a shower. One reporter described the fighter as uncouth, while another described his fighting style as, quote, a runaway beer truck, paid more for courage than for talent. The rinse and repeat process of returning to Argentina after a loss began again for Bonavena. 
Top contender Leotis Martin traveled to Buenos Aires for the payday, and Bonavena decisioned him over 10 rounds. Zora Foley also made the trip, and Bonavena got a revenge victory over the veteran. Oscar then got another shot at the now heavyweight champion Joe Frazier, eager to show that the first fight was not a fluke. Ever since that defeat, Bonavina has been screaming for a return match, claiming the two knockdowns he scored should have won the decision for him in their first meeting. But this time, the heavyweight championship is on the line, and Oscar Bonavina is the only man to have floored Smoking Joe in his entire professional career. Bonavina gets away from the ropes. He wants to try to stay in the center of the ring. In rounds two through four, Bonavina boxed smartly, scoring with sharp jabs, and avoided Fraser's rushes. Here in round five, Oscar is slightly ahead on points, but Joe is coming on strong. Joe's got Oscar pinned against the ropes. Oscar comes back with good, sharp punches, and then ties Joe up. A left right by Oscar, and Joe comes right back. It's very dangerous for Oscar to keep his back against the ropes, against this Joe Fraser. Joe seems to be picking his spots here in round five. Only two men have been able to go the full distance with Fraser since Joe turned professional about four years ago. Oscar Bonavina was the first, and then Scrap Iron Johnson managed to hang on for the distance six months later. Other than those two, every other man that stepped into the ring with Smoking Joe went home early. They included Billy Daniels, Eddie Machen, Doug Jones, Buster Mathis, and six months ago, Manuel Ramos. All were stopped by this rampaging Joe Fraser, who hates to leave them standing. Good punches by champion Joe Fraser. A good left uppercut by champion Joe Fraser, and Oscar comes right back with two punches of his own. Bonavina, a bull of a man. A tremendous left hook by Joe Fraser. A left uppercut by Joe Fraser. They don't seem to phase Oscar. Fraser keeping the pressure on Oscar Bonavina. Margin, but rounds 9 through 13 were all Fraser with Joe punching away at the defensive-minded Bonavina. Here in round 14, it's still anyone's fight, as Joe has been unable to get in that one big KO punch he's always looking for. Fraser pinning Bonavina against the ropes. Both fighters seem to be very tired here in round 14. still keeping his right hand high but getting a good right from champion Joe Fraser. Oscar comes back with a right that misses. Fraser pins Oscar right back into the corner. Bonavina established himself as the leading challenger for Fraser's heavyweight title with solid wins over Billy Daniels, George Chevallo, Carl Mildenberger, Zora Foley, and Leotis Martin. Oscar has won 37 out of 40 fights, never has been knocked off of his feet, and has 28 knockouts to his credit. If he goes the route tonight, he will have finished 25 full rounds with Joe Fraser, a man who, even at this early stage of his career, is being compared favorably with Rocky Marciano. champion Joe Fraser and it's a very happy champion who congratulates Oscar Bonavina for the fine effort that pushed Joe to his limits. The only question remaining in the minds of fight fans all over the world is what's going to happen when Smoking Joe gets into the same ring with retired champion Muhammad Ali. Bonavina started slow but finished strong. An effort that was too little too late as he lost a decision. I hit his chin so much that my hands ached for six months, Frazier said after. Bonavena repeated his same pattern, 
returning to Argentina and campaigning there for over a year and a half until getting the call to face Muhammad Ali at Madison Square Garden. Bonavena showed no respect for Ali during the buildup for the fight, predicting an 11th round knockout. At the press conference, Bonavena went on a rant, calling Ali a black kangaroo and a maricón, a Spanish slur for a homosexual. He said Ali was a chicken for not going to Vietnam. Ali was visibly angered by Bonavena's remarks, but dismissed him as nothing more than a stepping stone for a fight with Frazier. He's talking too much, Ali said, and I just don't like a fighter who talks too much. Writer Ed Levitt didn't think too much of Bonavena's chances, calling him the great white hopeless. But Bonavena's new trainer, Gil Clancy, was confident, particularly after finding out that Ali had over 12 rounds of sparring the day before the fight. Clancy thought that meant that Ali was unsure of his own physical shape. Ali, meanwhile, broke from his own tradition of wearing white trunks with black trim, instead wearing trunks that were as red as a matador's cape. It'll be the matador against the bull, Ali said, and you know who always wins in the bull ring. Start of round one. Watch Ali as he circles steadily to the left. Watch Bonavina try and cut the ring on him, right in half, going right at him. He'll work hard to Ali's midsection if he can. Ali will use the left jabs, counting on the swiftness. A warning from Mark Khan. Ringo claiming that Ali shoved him down. Ringo in the blue trunks with the red waistband, Ali in the red trunks with the white waistband and white side trim. See Ringo's name on his pants. We're coming up. We're coming to the end of round eight. There's little action in this round. You got to stay above his feet. That's a good left. Good left by Bonavina as round eight ended. And we go back to Ali's corner. Bonavina all over. Marlin, holding, pushing. A left by Bonavina and it connected, believe me. There it is. Bonavina holding on. Crowd alive for a change. What has been a most sluggish performance. A minute 45 gone in round nine. Crowd exhorting Ali on. Bonavina fighting back. Ali raining punches upon him. One minute left. Don't no knockdown, no knockdown, no knockdown. Slip and a push by Ali. Now the two are going at it. 45 seconds left. Bonavina staggering, flying a left at Ali. The eye is cut. There's blood out of the left eye of Bonavina. Ali trying to make his prediction stick. He's chopping at him with the left. A good left by Bonavina in retaliation. Ali holding on, Ali tired. 20 seconds left in round nine, and Bonavina's gonna last this round. Bonavina coming into Ali. A tough, tough fighter, Oscar Bonavina, as the round ends, and the prediction fails. saw Oscar at his wildest there, missing, falling off balance, but there was no Ali to take advantage of. There was no speed left, there was no, no movement left. 130 left in the fight. Oh, that left floored him. It came from nowhere. Ali came through with a left. 
the crowd screaming, the first knockdown of the fight, he took the mandatory eight, and now Ali is behaving like the old Ali. One more knockdown in this round, the fight is automatically over. Bonavina is running. If he goes down again, it's over. Ali is the knockout winner at two minutes and three seconds by my unofficial clock of the final round. It began with a left. I'm going up to ring center. I like you. Just talk. I tell you, just talk. I told chicken because you nervous. It's all. Just talk. Fight it, fight it. Fight it, fight it. You champion. I understand what I'm saying. Thank you. I, I hope you can understand oh what God. Ringo was I saying. Had a nice time. He said, I'm sorry I called you chicken. You are a great champion. And, I say to and him, you can thank see you. the scene. And now. I want to say he's my roughest fight today. Okay. You champion. That does it. I'm sorry. Joe Frazier, Oscar said I'm champion, so watch yourself. You watch don't have it, to, watch you it. You don't Joe have Frazier. to apologize. Watch you, you win, you Frazier, because you better. You box him very well. Frazier, Ringo is saying no, Ali will beat Frazier, Frazier, but that's going to have to be proved in the ring. Frazier, thank you. Because I'm so strong, Frazier. Oh, thank you. You understand? Thank you. I love you, Oscar. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. It was said that the left hook that Ali landed in the 15th was one of the most powerful punches that he ever threw. No one ever gave me so much and so hard, Ali said of Bonavena after the fight. No one, either, has come to my dressing room the same night as he did to give me his congratulations and say honestly that I was a great champion. He invited me to dinner, too, and said to me, thanks, because by boxing with him, he won the biggest purse of his life. But the influx of money didn't help Bonavena in his personal life as he separated from his wife. She know like me, Bonavena said. I know like her, so she say bye-bye. Shortly after the fight, Bonavena attacked his brother-in-law as he tried to defend his sister from the fighter. The subsequent legal proceedings forced Bonavena to bow out of a scheduled bout with George Foreman. Oscar remained relatively inactive for the next two years, postponing fights at the last minute and becoming a headache for promoters. He then hooked up with promoter and manager Lauren Casina, a Canadian fight promoter who thought he could put Bonavena back on the right track. But Oscar remained incorrigible, attacking a tourist who was vacationing in Argentina. A fight with Jerry Corey was signed and cancelled as legal troubles once again tied up Bonavena. He finally showed up for a big fight, this go-around against Floyd Patterson, but lost a decision. Two years later, he faced Ron Lyle in what was considered to be his last chance. Bonavena once again lost a decision. He put up a modest win streak against journeyman opposition before signing to face Ken Norton in 1976 and once again pulled out of the bout at the last minute. Writer Jack Welsh was upset with Bonavena's penchant for pulling out of fights, stating, quote, We have always suspected that the Latin brawler has concrete between his ears. Oscar is a mortal lock to win the NPPA Award, the National Promoter's Pain in the Ass Award. Bonavena continued playing musical chairs with managers and trainers. Lauren Casina dropped him after Oscar refused to go to New Mexico for a fight. Trainer Jimmy DiPiano remained as his last holdout until Bonavena moved to Nevada to live at the Mustang Ranch brothel with new managers Joe and Sally Conforte. Joe Conforte was a cab driver in Oakland who pimped prostitutes for servicemen before moving his operation to Nevada. He converted a trailer into a house of ill repute, moving from county to county before local sheriffs could get a beat on him. Joe's wife Sally took over as Bonavena's manager, promoting his bout against Billy Joyner on February 26, 1976, with the headline of The Beauty and the Beast. Bonavena weighed in at an overweight 218 pounds and looked sluggish throughout the fight. Reporters asked if his heart was still in the sport. It's neither young or old, Bonavena said, pointing at his chest. It's the flame. When the flame is okay, the fighter is all right. Bonavena then married Cheryl Ann Ribido, also known as Buffy, one of the prostitutes in the brothel. But the marriage was annulled ten days later as Oscar began an affair with Sally Conforte. The 59-year-old madam was 26 years Bonavena's senior. She was overweight with high blood pressure and diabetes, limping around the brothel on swollen legs. But Oscar seemed smitten with the older woman, taking her to restaurants and clubs, showing her off. Sally responded to the attention by losing weight, dropping from a size 16 to a size 12. As soon as he moved into my house, Joe Conforte testified, he got real, real chummy with my wife. 
Meanwhile, Joe moved the Mustang Ranch to a new million-dollar fortress, heavily promoting a grand opening. But Oscar was front and center on opening night. As the guests were coming in, Joe Conforti testified, Bonavena had one of my big cigars in his mouth, and he was telling everybody, how do you like my new joint? Joe found out that Sally was taking four to five hundred dollars at least every other day from the brothel till and giving the money to Bonavena, who gambled it away. Later, Joe and Oscar had words at the brothel, with the pimp holding a gun to Oscar's head before ordering him to leave. Joe was upset over confirming Oscar's intimate relationship with Sally. He was also angry that Bonavena was talking as if he were about to take over the brothel. The ranch was now in Sally's name, and Oscar wanted in. If he ever comes back on the premises, Joe told bodyguard Willard Ross Brimer, kill him. Joe later testified that he asked Bonavena to leave Reno and gave him enough money for a plane ticket back to New York. Instead, Oscar drank and gambled the money away, spending the night at the Sundanner Hotel. He reportedly received a phone call that Saturday morning and stormed out of the casino. Joe testified that Sally told him after the shooting that Bonavena called her at 4.30 a.m. that morning. He was drinking and had her gun. I'm going out there and I'm going to shoot Joe, Oscar allegedly told Sally, and I'm going to shoot everyone in sight. Bonavena arrived at the ranch's front gates around 6 a.m. What happened next wasn't clear. There was testimony that Oscar demanded to see Joe Conforte. Some believe that he wanted only to recover his passport from the trailer. What is certain is that bodyguard Joe Coletti was standing at the gate when he saw Bonavena crouch down behind his car. Coletti then heard someone yell, freeze, and a shot rang out. He turned and saw Brimer holding a high-powered rifle. Brimer was 6'3", 230 pounds, with an exotropic eye which deviated 40 degrees to the right. One writer described that it gave him almost peripheral vision, and he was surely a bad shot, which a detective later disputed. Oscar was shot directly in the heart, dying instantly. His body was then moved so no firm conclusion could be made as to where the location of the shooter was. It was estimated that Brimer shot Bonavena from no more than 50 feet away. Joe Conforte got into a shouting match with the arriving police, pointing at Bonavena's dead body, saying, quote, So we got a dead man here. So what? The investigation was botched from the beginning as Sheriff Robert Del Carlo insisted that he handle the investigation himself without help from the state. A brothel security guard named Lloyd McNulty admitted to placing a 38 caliber snub-nosed pistol beneath Bonavena's body, post-mortem. Police later found another pistol inside Oscar's boot. Both guns were registered to Sally Conforti. Inside Oscar's pocket was an envelope with Sally's name written across it, holding a handful of 38 caliber bullets. Oscar had over $6,000 cash on his person. The autopsy showed him testing negative for drugs with an alcohol level of .07. Brimer was arrested, but Joe put up his restaurant, The Cabin in the Sky, as a property bond for getting the bodyguard out on bail. Brimer was charged with murder, and after a mistrial, pled guilty to a charge of voluntary manslaughter. He was sentenced to two years in the state prison, but released after 15 months. In 1985, Brimer was back in jail for selling Valium to an undercover cop. He was paroled in 1991, and after a brief stint in jail, died as a free man in June of 2000. Four days after the murder, Sally took over at the Mustang Ranch. She fired all the security guards, tore down the gun tower, and the prostitutes welcomed her with open arms. Meanwhile, Joe Conforti seemed to revel in the controversy. One of his favorite sayings was, quote, Some good comes from every adversity. In the year after Bonavena's murder, both Joe and Sally were arrested on 10 counts of income tax evasion. Sally was fined $10,000 and given a suspended sentence. Joe filed appeal after appeal before forfeiting $40,000 bail and fleeing to Brazil. In 1983, he cut a deal with federal prosecutors to return and testify against Judge Harry Claiborne of Nevada. Conforti paid Claiborne a $30,000 bribe to stop a voter fraud investigation and 55000 to get a tax evasion charge dropped. Joe returned to manage the Mustang Ranch after it was auctioned off for $1.5 million, but the corporation that won the auction was represented by the brother of Conforti's lawyer. Joe retired as manager of the brothel in 1991, once again moving back to Brazil. 
Sally died in 1992, succumbing to diabetes and bad kidneys. Joe didn't attend her funeral and remained in Brazil until dying in March of 2019 at the age of 93. Three days after the murder, Oscar's brother Vicente arrived in Reno. He immediately broke into tears at the sight of his brother's lifeless body. I'm not here to make trouble, Vicente said, just to pick up my brother's body. Ringo played the role of a braggart. Raul Gorosito, Oscar's former sparring partner, said, He always had the biggest shining car with a Havana cigar dangling from his mouth, always walking as though the world strode with him. All that was a great lie because the real Bonavena was only known by a few, and it is that memory he left us. Over 150,000 mourners filled a stadium for Oscar's funeral. The headline for a Buenos Aires news magazine read, A bullet stole his life, but not the legend. <laughs>